Thank you, uh, Father. It's certainly slightly a little bit intimidating to be studying in Oxford, looking down on all of you great professors and lecturers in Oxford. Archbishop Sapon, who has been presented as a member of Kankian Hall, was actually, uh, he taught me first year in theology. And then uh, he was appointed a bishop, and so he went off. But Lord, uh, my Lord, uh, Lord Parton, Chancellor of uh, this university, Reverend Masters, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I bring all of you warm greetings from the Pontifical Council of Justice and Peace, and I wish to thank Master Brendan Callaghan for the invitation to deliver the fourth Newman Lecture. I wish to begin this address by reading from an article that I just stumbled upon just this past week. Written in 2008, it began this way. Tony Blair converted to Catholicism when he left number 10 Downing Street. Less known is his attachment to the faith and to religion in private and in public life. He claims that one cannot attempt to govern the world without understanding what touches people deeply and meets their irresistible aspiration to spirituality. The article goes on, with his conversion, Mr. Blair contradicts what our European context has long wanted to hide and what Euro Europeans do not share, and that the religions live in the heart of many societies in this world, in the hearts of many cultures. This paragraph, my dear friends, explains why I was happy to accept an invitation to speak about faith and reason in public life here at Oxford. And perhaps also explains why you, Reverend Masters and distinguished guests, also decided to attend this public lecture. You know, two years ago, and uh, uh, two years after uh, the writing of this article, so 2010, we found ourselves in Hyde Park. This was the 18th of September, where the Holy Father, Pope Benedict XVI, offered some lessons from the life of Blessed John Harry Newman. He said, here is the first, uh, and he said, uh, this is the first lesson we can learn from the life of Blessed Harry Newman. The Pope went on, Newman reminds us that as men and women made in the image and likeness of God, we were created to know the truth, to find in that truth our ultimate freedom and the fulfillment of our deepest human aspirations. In a word, we are meant to know Christ, who is himself the way, the truth, and the life. The Pope went on. The second lesson Harry Newman, Blessed Newman, teaches us is that if we have accepted the truth of Christ and committed our lives to him, there can be no separation between what we believe and the way we live our lives. He saw clearly that we do not so much accept the truth in a purely intellectual act as embrace it in a spiritual dynamic that penetrates to the core of our being. Even if that passion for the truth intellectual honesty and genuine conversion becomes very costly. The third lesson, according to the Holy Father, 
It's uh, the words of uh, Newman that truth that sets us free cannot be kept to ourselves. It calls for testimony. It begs to be heard. And in the end, its convincing power comes from itself and not from human eloquence or the arguments in which it may be couched. These three lessons of Blessed Henry Newman, to seek the truth, to live it, and to witness to it, are lessons that we now want to apply to public life. Beginning with a short consideration then of the place of reason in life, we shall proceed to consider the harmony between reason and faith. Then we shall seek the place of faith and reason in public life as the presence of truth. And then identify the social doctrine of the church as privileged guidelines for living the truth of faith and reason in public life and in the world. So first, beginning with reason. It was Bernard Lonergan. <laughs> no, that's not yes. It was Bernard Lonergan, without you, you know, uh, respect, who once observed that an animal, when sated, goes to sleep. A person, after eating, might wonder, who are we? Where do we come from? Where are we going? Why is there evil in the world? And after this, what comes next? Thus, to be human is to be someone who asks questions and searches for answers. And this has been so from the very beginning of human history. History shows that all cultures have journeyed on a path that has sometimes that has brought humanity to progressively encounter the truth and to face it very squarely. The more man knows reality and the world, the more he knows himself. And the more present becomes the social question, and indeed the question of man's very existence. These questions are present in the Bible, in the sacred texts of Hindus, Taoists, Buddhists, and so on, and they are found equally in the poems and the tragedies and in the philosophical treatises of the, of the ancient Greeks. And they are found also in the proverbs and the folklore of traditional societies. They are questions that have their common flow and source in the ever-present quest for meaning that drops in the human heart. And the response to each question, in fact, depends on how one understands one's existence. So to grow in the knowledge of truth, so as to make one's life more human, man has very many resources. Among these emerges philosophy, not only understood as a written work of philosophers, but also as a spontaneous thought that asks questions that asks about the profound sense of existence and attempts to provide an answer. This human trait of philosophizing, if you want, is the noblest task of humanity. And besides this form of truth, we also need those forms which facilitate the living of daily life. And here, we must underscore the important contributions which science and technology, especially in this modern age, have made to personal and social development. The Second Vatican Council recognized the same when it observed, with a passionate exercise of creativity through the centuries, man has certainly made progress in the empirical sciences in the technical sciences and in the liberal disciplines. In our age, man has achieved noteworthy successes 
particularly in the area of research and in the domain of the material world. But man is not only and merely a martyr. Accordingly, man also needs to search for the truth in the areas of practical morality, how to do good with one's ethical conduct, and this, in fact, is the conduct or the way of living that makes for true personal development, the gate towards perfection and the means of happiness. This ethical quest is also a universal reality because all cultures have maxims concerning behavior whose basic features and outlines are similar. Ethical truth, though unlike technical, technological, or technical truth, is not cumulative with the passage of generations maintaining the acquired truth of the past and adding new elements to this truth. In the area of morality, knowledge is a term more of the heart than of the intellect. It is therefore a thing to be learned, accepted, and lived right from the onset. So the truth about which we have spoken thus far belong to the field of human reason. They can be acquired through the application of natural faculties of man. However, there are limitations of all types to this type of truth, personal and impersonal, which make it difficult for a human being to find every truth all alone. One such a limitation is the immensity of the body of truth that exists as a result of the richness of created reality itself. It is particularly difficult, if not impossible, for any person to attain all of these truths. Thus, it is increasingly the case that truths which people believe especially on the authority of other people, are far more numerous than those which they believe as a result of their own verification and research. Who would be able, for example, to filter, to sift critically, the incredible amount of scientific data on which modern life is based? Who could personally check the reliability of the torrents of information that daily arrive at our doorsteps from all parts of the world and which are accepted mostly as true. And finally, who could treasure, who could remake the journeys of experience and thinking that have led to the accumulated treasures of wisdom and spirituality of humanity. So man, the being who asks questions and searches for the truth is also a being who lives by faith. Let us note another limitation to reason. The fact that human reason cannot grasp every reality does not imply the non-existence of such reality. For instance, it would be observed for a physicist to deny the existence of psychic phenomena just because they cannot be observed by the methodology of physics. The study of these phenomena requires another methodology, a methodology that is similar, though not the same, to the one involved in understanding other concepts such as supernatural faith. It is important to know that the truths obtained by the application of a certain methodology, if genuine, cannot be opposed to those obtained by the application of another methodology. Similarly, the truth of faith cannot be opposed to those of reason, but neither can they also be arrived at by reason alone. And it's in this sense that St. Anselm, Archbishop of Canterbury, years ago, speaking about the truth of God, said, Sometimes I thought I could already grasp what I was looking for, 
and sometimes it escaped my mind completely. Finally, I gave up hope. I decided to stop looking for something that was impossible to find. But when I tried to stifle that thought altogether, lest by occupying my mind with useless speculation, it should keep me from things I could actually accomplish, it began to hound me more and more, although I resisted and fought against it. Then, one day, when my violent struggle against its hounding had worn me down, the thumb I had despair, despair of finding presented itself in the very clash of my thoughts, so that I eagerly embraced the thought, uh, embraced the thought I had been taking such pains to drive away. It was for this and many other reasons that Archbishop Anselm entitled his prosology Fides Querens Intellectum, Faith Searching for Reason. And faith and reasoning then are inevitably attracted to one another. There is, in fact, an interesting harmony between the two. And it is this harmony between faith and reason that I briefly now want to consider. The existing distinction between the methodologies of the various sciences does not mean that they cannot communicate or that they are irreconcilable. And interdisciplinary research in this regard is used a useful means of obtaining a more complete truth. In that sense, it is a good thing that faith and reason work together to arrive at a full truth. In scriptures, there is a profound and indissoluble unity between knowledge of reason and that of faith. The Bible, for example, affirms that faith is essential to better understand the realities of this world because they also make God known and they reveal his works. And this, however, faith neither suppresses the autonomy of reason nor does this curtail its range of activity. When in sacred scriptures man, the world, and the events of history are presented, they are analyzed and assessed with all the endowments of reason, but never to the exclusion of faith. The role of faith in this regard is to refine the inner eye, opening the mind to discover the providence of God at work. And thus, for example, in the book of Proverbs we read, the human mind plans the way but the Lord directs the steps. There is therefore no competition between reason and faith. One requires the other, and each has its own function. The same book of Proverbs teaches us, it is the glory of God to conceal things, and it is the glory of kings to investigate them. The Lord is the source of all things, in him is the fullness of meaning, and this is the glory of God. Man has a task of searching for the truth with his reason, and this constitutes the nobility of his being. So the Psalms go on, the Psalms go on to clarify the issue further relating faith to reason. But all of this then leads us to Blessed Henry Newman, who wrote, I wish the intellect to range with the utmost freedom and religion to enjoy an equal freedom. But what I am stipulating for is that they should be found in one and the same place and exemplified in the same persons. I want to destroy that diversity of centers which puts everything into confusion by creating a contrariety of influences. 
I wish the same spots and the same individuals to be at, the, at once oracles of philosophy and shrines of devotion. It will not satisfy me what satisfies so very many people to have two independent systems, intellectual and religious, going at once side by side by a sort of division of labor and only accidentally brought together. It will not satisfy me if religion is here and science is there. In our own day, the scientific and technical progress of the past centuries, together with other factors, have favored a predominance of pragmatic reasoning which sometimes reinforce and emphasize the separation between faith and reason, and which leads sometimes also to the erosion of transcendent truths and anything that has to do with faith. The consequences have been the separation between ethics and technology, and the birth of a technocratic ideology. This ideology is based on the belief that the human being is self-sufficient and able to develop on its own. And this has led to the widespread presumption of total autonomy and a corresponding sense of man's auto-salvation, if you want. Experience shows that this attitude has caused and continues to cause adverse effects on the sense of personal, integral development of the human person. Thus, man thinks that he owes nothing to anyone except to himself, and he believes that he only has rights. There is a continuous modern demand for more rights, the removal of every limit, and the progressive widening of the scope of mind's action after contemplating the idea of self-reproduction. This dynamic while it, true, while it closes up man in an egoistic self-production, also prevents him from assuming any duties without which all rights are sucked into a self-referential spiral which eradicates every meaning to human existence. So in a globalized world, this is particularly serious and dangerous. On the one hand, as Pope Benedict XVI observes, Appeals are made to alleged rights, arbitrary and non-essential in nature, accompanied by the demand that they be recognized and promoted by public structures and authorities. While on the other hand, elementary and basic rights remain unacknowledged and are violated in much of the world. The sense of the common good disappears. While man's vision of his true vocation to authentic and true love, his true vocation to being a gift, his vocation to unity and brotherhood, and his vocation to solidarity and to transcendence and to communion are all be clouded. This is because the supremacy of technology tends to prevent people from recognizing anything that cannot be explained in terms of matter alone. It makes a modern culture generally diffident about truth, or at least about the possibility of attaining any profound truths about a human person who shows the meaning of human life itself, personal or social. And yet, as for Benedict again will teach, everyone experiences the many immaterial and spiritual dimensions of life. The development of individuals and peoples is likewise located on a height. If we consider the spiritual dimensions that must be present, if such a development is to be authentic. It requires new eyes and new heart, capable of rising above the materialistic vision of human events, capable of glimpsing in development the beyond that technology cannot give. So Christian doctrine shows that man has always 
sought and discovered truth deeper than mere functional truth and technological truth, and that he has a duty to live by that truth. In fact, Christians who live in an increasingly globalized society are called not only through a responsible civic, economic, and political engagement, but also through the witness of their love and faith to make a valuable contribution to the painstaking and stimulating work of justice, integral human development, and the proper outrun of human affairs. It is therefore necessary to cultivate a wise system of reasoning and thinking that is open to faith, taking into account the full truth about man. The part then of man through life is in the embrace of both faith and reason. Faith and reason helping one another. And this was also the wish of Blessed Henry Newman, who said, I want a laity, not arrogant, not rash in speech, not disputatious, but men who know their religion and who enter into it, who know just where they stand, who know what they hold and what they do not, who know their creed so well that they can give an account of it, who know so much of history that they can defend it. I want an intelligent, well-instructed laity. I wish you to enlarge your knowledge to cultivate your reason, to get an insight into the relation of truth to truth, to learn to view things as they are, and to understand how faith and reason stand to each other. What are the basis and the principles of Catholicism? More close to our days, Francis Joseph Sheed also known as a prophet of Hyde Park, believed that in order to see things the way they really are, one needs to exercise the mind to dust off the intellect and apply it to the world around us. Thus, many of Sheet's apologetic writings begin with an explanation of the human intellect, what it is and what it does. But he also understood the in inherent limitations of the human intellect. It's an indispensable instrument for navigating our journey through life. But it isn't the only tool God has given us. Divine revelation is God's gift to the human mind. It provides information that left to its own powers, even the keenest human intellect could never discover. It further illuminates those areas man's mind has reached through its own natural powers. A revelation leads the mind to the proper conclusions. So, the separation between faith and reason, and so the exclusion sometimes of religion from public life, is artificial and gives public life less space to open towards the transcendence. Without this primary experience then, it is difficult to orient a society towards universal ethical principles and very hard to create national and international realities where fundamental freedoms and rights can become fully recognized and fully fulfilled. And so again, Blessed Henry Newman would have us, or would uh, teach us, if there be religious truth at all, we cannot shut our eyes to it without prejudice to truth of every kind, physical, metaphysical, historical, and even moral. For it bears upon all truth. Benedict XVI on his part would show in his works that both faith and reason have the task of assessing the adequacy of the other. Reason always needs the purification of faith, and this is also valid for political reasoning. That does not have to be considered superior to other kinds of reason. 
It is also true that religion always needs purification from reason to show its authentic human side. The misinterpretation of this dialogue results in an arrested development of humankind. If these observations of Blessed Henry Newman and Pope Benedict XVI have any merit at all, then it is important to have the ethical contributions of religion in the political sphere. It should not be marginalized or prohibited, but perceived as a valid contribution towards the promotion of the common good and the development of the human person. So, we come then to consider the possibility then that the service of faith and reason to public life is actually the establishment of truth. The reality of our society and world shows that a coercive external system is not enough for the development of a good society. There is a need for an inter internalization of moral behaviors in order to ensure the general spiritual growth of people, as well as social structures. In fact, people in public life behave in accordance with their vision of the world, of humankind, and of the common goal. Therefore, a community that is not founded on truth usually tends to decline. While, on the other hand, the more people and institutions are committed to seeking the truth, the more they attain the true well-being on a personal and social levels, reducing despotism and quarrels. Reducing despotism and quarrels. This is also what Blessed Harry Newman saw. For he would say, as we advance in the perception of the truth, we, are, we all become less fitted to be controversialists. And so in order, in another instance then, of the great convergences between the thoughts of Blessed Henry Newman and Pope Benedict XVI, we, we know the Pope right again. Truth, in fact, is Logos, which created Dialogos. And hence, communication in communion. Truth by enabling men and women to let go of their subjective opinions and impressions allows them to move beyond cultural and historical limitations to come together in the assessment of the value and the substance of things. Truth opens and unites our minds in the logos of love. It is therefore necessary to give credibility to truth, demonstrating its persuasive and authenticating power in the practical setting of social level. This is a matter of no small account, especially in our day. In a social and cultural context which relativizes truth, often paying little heed to it and showing increasingly reluctance to acknowledge its existence. This talk about truth does not refer only to technical truth. It refers also to the truth of wisdom and the truth of morality. It, if further development calls for the work of more and more technicians, even more necessary is the deep thought and reflection of wise men in search of new humanism, which will enable modern man to find himself anew by embracing higher values of love, friendship, prayer, and even contemplation. In his meeting with the bishops of the United Kingdom last September here in uh, London, Pope Benedict recalled that in their work choosing the common good, the bishops had underlined the importance of the practice of virtue in public life. The Pope highly commended that and then went on to add, today's circumstances provide a very good opportunity to reinforce that message 
and indeed to encourage people to aspire to higher moral values in every area of their lives against the background of growing cynicism regarding even the possibility of virtuous living. It is therefore necessary to cultivate a conception of wisdom and truth, wisdom and truth of all types, political, economic, ecological, and so on, which are open to faith and which take into account the full truth about the human person. For the development of a good society, morality needs to find expression in public life and not be excluded or privatized. Indeed, politics and diplomacy should look to the moral and spiritual patrimony offered by the great religions of the world in order to acknowledge and affirm the universal truths, principles, and values which cannot be denied without denying the dignity of the human person itself. But what does all of this mean? In practical terms then, what does it mean to promote moral truth in the world of politics and diplomacy? It means acting in a responsible way on the basis of an objective and integral knowledge of the facts. It means deconstructing political ideologies which end up supplanting truth and human dignity in order to promote pseudo-values under the pretext of peace, development, and even human rights. It means fostering an unanswered or unswerving commitment to base positive law on the principles of natural law. All of this is necessary and consistent with a respect for the dignity and worth of the human person. So, talking about the truth in public life, I wish to illustrate this with a, an example of a public dialogue. Just last September, in Hyde Park, 80,000 of the Catholic community awaiting the Holy Father's arrival took part in a Stand Up Against Poverty show. This action anticipated the United Nations, United Nations General Assembly in New York to review the Millennium Development Goals, solemnly pledged 10 years earlier. The issue was, could real progress still be made to overcome poverty for the poorest and most of the disadvantaged throughout the world? Could these promises be ever fulfilled, and especially fulfilled by 2015? This is the message that was sent from Hyde Park then to the summit. The Catholic Church worldwide, together with many faith communities, has been committed to making the Millennium Development promises a reality. We've been invited to stand up against poverty, to send our message inspired by the gospel. So together we stand with millions of people around the world. We stand to show our commitment to tackle, to tackle poverty and injustice in the world. And we stand under the shadow of the gospel and we stand to say to the world, leaders, keep your promises. This message was entrusted to me. Due to leave a few hours for New York as a head of the delegation of the Holy See to the discussion of the Millennium Development Goals at that summit. They wished me Godspeed, and two days later, I delivered the message in the Great Hall of the United, General, the United Nations General Assembly. In March 2011, I returned to London and found myself in another Great Hall with about 700 Catholic lay people engaged in youth ministry most of whom had been at Hyde Park in September 2010. We watched a short film about a stand-up action 
including their sending me off to New York. And so six months later, I stood there to report the mission as mission accomplished and explain why it was important for the church to be a voice at the summit. <clears throat> it was important for the church to be there to give and pronounce, express a religious voice and the voice of faith that sought to accompany and to engage the voices of statistics and of demographic and scientific analysis in dialogue. It was necessary for religion again to be in dialogue with science and in, with reason. And the small mission of the Holy See, with its religious-based message, only served to provide and to illustrate the ongoing dialogue that must always exist between faith and reason. This truth then of faith and reason, whose dialogue is required to maintain truth in society and to guide the conduct of social living, is what comes to life in the social doctrine of the church. In the post synodal apostolic exhortation, Verbum Domini, Pope Benedict XVI observed that God's word inspires men and women to build relationships based on rectitude and justice and testifies to the great value in God's eyes of every effort to create a more just and more life, uh, livable world. The word of God itself unambiguously denounces injustices and promotes solidarity and equality in the world. In the light of the Lord's words, let us discern the signs of the times present in history and not flee from the snow of, uh, and not flee from a commitment to those who suffer and are victims of forms of selfishness. For this reason, the Synod Fathers wish to say a special word to all who take part in political and social life. The evangelization of the spread of God's word ought to inspire their activity in the world. And as they work for the true common good in respecting and promoting the dignity of every person, they need to be primarily informed by the gospel and they need to be formed in the principles of the church's social doctrine. Similarly, when last November, our dicastery, Justice and Peace in Rome, met in a plenary assembly, the Holy Father addressed a message to that assembly in which again the Holy Father said, the immediate task of working for a just and social order belongs to the lay faithful. And it is necessary to form a laity capable of dedicating itself to the common good, especially in the very complex area of politics. Here, however, for Benedict the system went on to identify the social teaching of the church as representing the essential reference point for the planning and the social action of the Catholic lay faithful, as well as for their spiritual life. So the reference to self-dedication to common good refers to one of the basic principles of the Catholic social doctrine, the other principles being the dignity and the rights of the human person, universal destination of the goods of the earth, a preferential option for the poor, subsidiarity, participation, and solidarity. As social doctrine of the church, it was first described as such in the social and cyclical of Pope Leo XIII in 1891, 120 years ago, last May 15th. 
and in it, the insights of scripture, theology, philosophy, economics, ecology, politics, and all, have been harnessed coherently to formulate a social teaching that places the human person, his total and integral development, at the center of all world systems of thought and activity. So a true understanding of the church's social doctrine starts with the faith experience of the Christian ecclesial community itself. Responding to God's revelation of his love and truth in Jesus Christ, people are transformed by the power of God's word and re-socialized by the love in the Holy Spirit. The new social reality, the ecclesial community, proclaims the love and the truth of the Trinitarian life which surrounds it. From this existence then, people become subjects of love and of truth, called to become agents of a new freedom and a new way of thinking, called to become instruments of grace and of communion, spreading the good news of God's love, weaving networks of love and of truth. This baptismal experience of life of the ecclesial community does not close in on itself, but interacts at every level with the world. It is in living in Jesus, the supreme truth and the good, that the faithful discover a new and appropriate order of goods and an authentic scale of values. Thus, the Catholic social doctrine emerges at a public crossroad where Christian life and conscience come into contact with the real world to build a fuller expression of justice and charity into the structure of human life in common. The world, our human society, or if you want, the rest uh, socialist, the context of the church's social teaching has changed over the years from the misery of workers in the days after the Industrial Revolution, which underlay the writing of Pobleo de Tetens Rerum Novarum, the crisis of the 1929-1930s, the economic crisis, which was the basis and the context of Pope Pius XI's Quattrogesimo Anno, decolonization and the appearance of third worldism of Pope John XXIII, in his book, his encyclical Martel et Magistra and Pacem in Terrace, and Pope Paul VI Popularum Progressio and Gaudium Espes of the Second Vatican Council, to John Paul II's Laboris Excelsis and Solitude Re Socialis and Centissimus Annus, to our own day, where the, the, the experience of the world, globalization, underdevelopment, financial, economic, and moral, and anthropological crisis constituted the background for the social and cyclical of Pope Benedict the system called Caritas in Veritate. So in these changing situations, the, the social and cyclicals of the popes have variously formulated the church's social doctrine to apply Christian faith and the charity of Christ to the various contexts of human life. So, the church's social teaching illuminates with an unchanging light the new problems that are constantly emerging in human life and in society. Catholic social doctrine then is illumined by faith and inspired by the love of Christ. It is in friendly dialogue with all branches of knowledge and it expresses the church's teaching, uh, it expresses the church's teaching office or the church's teaching ministry. It provides principles for reflection, criteria for judgment, and avenues for concrete action with view to doing two things. One, to promoting an integral and solidary humanism that will inspire a collective sense of responsibility, and two, to fashion in a society reconciled in justice and love. Four, man's earthly activity, when inspired and sustained by charity, contributes 
to building an earthly city of unity and peace, which is an anticipation and prefiguration of the universal city of God. The full truth of man and the manner of public management shows that successes and failures in each area of public life have their origins in the human heart. To commit oneself to a more just functioning of society goes with committing oneself to a better Christian living, a better Christian life. Therefore, let us not separate, much less still oppose the religious and the social dimensions of life, faith and reason, and the fact that they need to come together to pursue that truth which only can guide our public life. Having considered several examples then, I believe, none of them I believe, admitting of an obvious or simple solution, I might now ask, can you imagine being happy to belong to a communion whose leader raises such questions about social living and the need for faith and reason to dialogue? Or is there someone else whom you would prefer raising such questions? Let me then conclude, my dear friends, by saying this. Once upon a time in this country, to be British and to be Catholic were treated as contradictory and incompatible. In fact, to be Catholic was to be criminal. Today it is brighter. Today things are brighter. And you have given me a very sympathetic hearing. But if what I have said sounds antique or novel, this may be a measure of the secularization which is probably sweeping all of us off our feet. And that is rightly taking place in this land and to our Europe. The article I referred to earlier on about Mr. Tony Blair continues to say this. Enlightenment, enlightenment thought would have us all believe that the irresistible progress of humanity whereas were synonymous with the extinction of religions of which we would have no more need. Today, it seems axiomatic that public life has no space for morality, can make no spiritual demand upon anyone. So are we better for having the public space swept so clean of religion and of moral truth? You see, my dear friends then, the Enlightenment assumption is restrictive and rather, instead of liberating, becomes rather constrictive. And for giving such attention to what I far to say and to tell you this evening, I wish to thank all of you for your kind and sympathetic uh, hearing, and I thank you for your kind attention. And may blessed Henry Newman support and intercede for us as we search through faith and reason to discover the one truth that leads all of us in public life and that leads all of us in living in a just and a fair society. Thank you. job at this stage to respond on, on behalf of us all to express our gratitude. We've done that briefly and we'll do it more formally in a moment or two. It is my job just for a few minutes to invite questions. Um, I thought what we might, we, we don't have very long for questions but we do have time for a few. So if anybody would like to put a question to Cardinal Turkson, if they, if they could please Perhaps just for ease of ease of uh, hearing, uh, stand and uh, put that question. 
Sir. Please. Um, uh, question for you. Uh, you mentioned uh, early in your speech that, that the, the physicists can't find proof of, of some uh, a phenomenon like um, psychic, psychic uh, phenomenon. But isn't it possible for the, the religious man to incorporate the science into his life, but it seems more difficult for the physicist to incorporate religion into his reality, because from, from his perspective, it seems uh, unnatural for that to be able to occur. So my question for you is, uh, how do we reconcile that? How do we reconcile the science with the religion from the scientific perspective? Actually, I suppose that's the point of the presentation. The point of the presentation is to invite both science and faith to recognize that they need to come together to discover the same truth. So physics does draw conclusions about the truth, and so does faith. So the point of it all is not to, to uh, consider both of them as mutually exclusive, but rather as complementary and coming together to discover the truth. So as I observed, uh, uh, you know, uh, reason needs faith to direct its search, just as faith needs reason to also sharpen its focus about the human re reality about which it seems to discover the truth. So the point of it is to invite to a dialogue between faith and reason rather than the dichotomy that exists between them and the tendency to compartmentalize these two, like in the words of Henry Newman, who wants to see the two of them come together. Do you think that we can learn from the culture around about us? Do you think we can learn moral truth from outside our own tradition? Do you think sorry, we, I did it. Do you think we can learn from the culture around us and learn moral truth from other than from our own tradition? Uh, definitely. Definitely I think I think we can. From our own tradition probably means you know Christian tradition. Yes. I suppose the other religions have something to teach us. Do you uh, think the Enlightenment has something to teach us? Oh sure. For example, uh, the, 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 uh, you know, uh, the, the Enlightened, the, the Enlightenment, like when Pope Benedict, uh, you know, in Germany, uh, when he went for that famous, you know, uh, uh, talk at uh, Regensburg. Uh, this, 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 this was a point that he made, that the truth of enlightenment is useful also in sharpening the focus and providing the uh, bedrock for the truth of faith or the truth of the moral truth that we talk about. So it does help. In, 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 in other terms, very concretely a question in this regard that was put when you know, we were last in uh, New York about all of these things was about whether in everything that is going on about you know, uh, population, the issue of demographics and all, whether the two, science and you know, uh, doctrine, faith and morality can come together. And yes, they can come together. I mean, the conclusion arrived at by science in all its various searches about, about the need to manage population is also shared by Christian faith about the need to manage populations. The, 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 the two of them affirm the same need to manage population. One may uh, advise the use of a method which one may not agree to, but the other does also formulate a method which can the, other, uh, the other can accept. So it is possible and sometimes is the case that from both points of departure, faith and, uh, and uh, faith and uh, scientific rest or enlightenment or science and reason, they, 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 the same conclusion can be arrived at. And in this case, what about the fact that demographics, the way they're going uncontrolled and unmanaged, can lead to a crisis in the, you know, in the world. So the, the enlightenment does contribute to the truth of uh, morality, which uh, faith also arrives at. I think I draw us to a close at this stage, I, and I invite the, the Chancellor to do so on our behalf, just to remind you that there is a reception across St. Giles at Blackfriars immediately following on this.
Your Eminence, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I know that you wouldn't want me to come for long between you and the prospect of a reception at Blackfriars. <laughs> so I'll be very brief, but the brevity of my re remarks uh, does not, I hope, uh, indicate my lack of enthusiasm in responding, uh, Your Eminence, to your extremely uh, interesting remarks. Uh, and to expressing our gratitude for the leadership that, uh, that you have given to the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace. Um, this is the second uh, time that we've met. The first was during Pope Benedict's visit to uh, Britain last September. Uh, and I think we in Britain were particularly pleased in the Catholic community uh, that you accompanied uh, the Pope's official party. Uh, because it did ensure that we could see uh, a development, a thickening up of the dialogue uh, between our own uh, ministerial development agency uh, and the Catholic Church. Uh, a recognition on the part of the British government, I think of the British political class, uh, of the extent to which the uh, Catholic Church in many manifestations is in the front line of the struggle for social justice around the world, providing, I think I'm right in saying, for example, 25% of uh, education in sub-Saharan Africa and 25% uh, of all uh, health care, if not rather more. Uh, I came to this uh, lecture directly from the inaugural uh, lecture, uh, which has um, been given in honour of a Indian economist at this university, Professor Lau. Uh, and the first speaker during the panel which accompanied the lecture was uh, Amartya Sen, who has, of course, uh, written perhaps more uh, inspirationally um, and interestingly about the relationship between uh, development, economic development, and political freedom than anyone else. Uh, and it reminded me that uh, when I was um, a, uh, for five years in Asia, people very, very often used to ask me how uh, I accounted for what they used to describe as the Asian economic miracle. And I used to say that uh, as a Catholic, uh, I of course believed in miracles. <laughs> but that I didn't believe in economic miracles. <laughs> um, what I did believe, and it's a point that Amartya Sen was making today, what I did, did believe uh, was that uh, rigorous um, empirical study of the facts uh, led us to uh, understand those policies which were most likely uh, to deliver sustainable economic development and to deliver the sort of society with which we would feel comfortable, not only as Christians, but as uh, human beings with even a modicum of generosity. Uh, I think we know the extent to which uh, faith uh, and reason uh, should not work in separate silos when looking at uh, matters of international politics and economics, because invariably in the international sphere, uh, to do what is right is to do the right thing that uh, in Asia it was the investment in people's education, uh, particularly perhaps girls' education. It was the investment uh, in uh, primary health care which helped to produce the circumstances uh, in which um, development uh, became possible. Uh, and the Catholic Church and its agencies were heavily involved uh, in that work. You mentioned at your Eminence, the great uh, uh, vigil in Hyde Park in September. I remember talking to the organizers afterwards who said that they'd thought it was going to be rather like organizing a, uh, a prom concert. Uh, in the fact, in the event, they said it was much more like organizing a rock concert, <laughs> which said perhaps a good deal about the nature and variety of the Catholic community in this country. <clears throat> At the end of uh, that conference, as you said, uh, 80,000 people, um, the end of that uh, prayer vigil, 80,000 people committed themselves 
to supporting the uh, achievement of the Millennium Development Goals. But it's a matter of some interest that while there is a political consensus for that in this country, rarely, with every political party committed to achieving those goals, there isn't much of a consensus, strangely, outside the churches and outside the political process. Uh, and I think that it's very important that um, deploying our reason in the interests of our faith, uh, we should make sure that the argument for meeting those development goals doesn't go by default. Uh, very often you find, particularly in our media, uh, that it suggests that, that there is some disjuncture uh, between what we're committed to do to uh, deal with the uh, moral horrors uh, that exist in too many parts of the world. There is some disjuncture between that and our responsibilities to our own people at home. And I think it's extremely important um, that we uh, argue that that is not the case, that there is a direct relationship between our well-being um, and the well-being of other people in other parts of the world. Um, in his uh, great lecture on faith and reason in Westminster Hall, um, uh, His Holiness the Pope um, referred to several times um, to uh, Thomas More, uh, not surprisingly given the fact that his uh, life or death was associated with that uh, great uh, British historical monument. Um, St. Thomas More, uh, as we all know, though I think, I suspect that even at Oxford, few people will have read it, um, though Cardinal Newman would certainly have read it, Thomas More wrote a book called Utopia, um, a great work of uh, philosophy or political philosophy. Uh, Utopia, of course, means no place. And it was no place, and examples of that is that there weren't any lawyers, <laughs> and that uh, the affairs of those who lived there were properly ordered. Now, we're unlikely to live in utopia, but I think if we take to heart what you've said to us today, <coughs> Your Eminence, um, we're likely to come nearer to a proper ordering of human affairs. Uh, and we certainly recognize the uh, intellectually stimulating <coughs> nature of your remarks today uh, and of Pope Benedict's uh, remarks not only in Westminster Hall last year, but throughout his, uh, his uh, visit to the United Kingdom. Thank you very much indeed for coming here again today. Uh, you've been a, uh, a relatively frequent, but always very welcome visitor, uh, and we hope that we'll be able to encourage you uh, to come back to uh, this country and back to this university, where, as you will see, Catholics are now allowed to be educated. <laughs>